Um, okay, everyone, I'm going to be sharing my screen for a little bit and um, talking about my journey and some current projects uh, and about defining success for ourselves. And then we can do a little bit of a Q&A and just an open discussion. All right. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Or how are people? I guess I should do a little bit of crowd work. Um, how, how is this Thursday treating everyone if you want to reply in the chat? Chaos. <laughs> Chaos for Sam. Okay. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Doing great. Good. Good to hear it, Ellen. Your dogs are wet. Um, is it raining? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Victoria, I'm glad you're doing really well. All right, awesome. Um, cool. I am going to get started. Can everyone, can everyone see my screen? It says, oh, hey, Micah. Yes. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'll just start off giving you a briefer summary of, of myself than, uh, than Isaac gave, I guess, because he gave such a great introduction. But today, um, yeah, I will talk you through kind of how I got to where I am and what I'm working on um, and the questions that I ask myself uh, when I'm up late at night, which are around success and, and how do we define it. Um, so a little bit about me. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, I'm a first generation American. My mom is from Belize. Um, and I am a designer and a writer and a near futurist, which we can talk more about later. Um, but I get to have sort of this hybrid generalist role in my work uh, as the founder and creative director at Firebrand. Um, I was going to put a headshot here, but I decided instead that it would be more fun and I think more telling to do a, a picture of a self-portrait that, that I did this past summer. So we're going to do a little bit of time travel. I'm going to show you a timeline of the story so far and then uh, jump into a little bit more about Firebrand. So here are some rare uh, pieces of footage of me growing up. Um, I was born in the 1990s here in Inglewood um, and then moved to Gardena in the South Bay uh, to grow up. I was always super into um, magical things and sci-fi and fantasy and princess stuff. Uh, here's a picture of me from I think freshman or sophomore year and um, for school, I for my undergrad, I went to USC Roski, where I majored um, and had a BA in fine arts with an emphasis in graphic design, and then minored in communication design, which incorporated a little bit more of the um, classes from the journalism school and from the business school. Uh, in 2016, after I graduated, I moved to Honolulu for um, a few months and for the rest of the year I worked as the head of design at Unum building out um, the brand and the first versions of the app. Some of you might might know it as the um, Instagram planning app. And then after that I worked at Clever Creative um, for about three years and they're a small shop here in Los Angeles. I did a lot of brand work for them um, and some web design and print design as well. And I got a lot of my footing and sort of like hands-on education there in terms of figuring out what disciplines within design I wanted to do. Um, while I was working there, I was also freelancing because student loans are real. Uh, and those uh, folks that I freelanced with, as well as the work I was doing at Clever, um, inspired me to really think about what kind of brands and what kind of work I wanted to be doing. Um, so this past May, I, I left my job there and decided to work full time for myself. And that was when I started Firebrand. Um, as we all know, <laughs> March slash this summer uh, threw everybody for an absolute loop and 
the uh, timing of Firebrand was sort of serendipitous. It it uh, <laughs> is partially because of the state of the world and partially because I wanted to try something new and, and working for myself wasn't something I'd done before. Um, I had worked at, I'd interned at an ad agency, I'd worked and done the startup thing and the freelance thing, um, and then worked at a, a studio um, and worked in house and, and worked in edu education sort of at uh, like research, research institutes. Um, so this firebrand is kind of my next chapter and adventure of me figuring out um, how I work best. And then uh, I'm here today in, in October 2020, giving this talk to you guys and time goes on. So these are some of the sort of core ideas that orbit uh, Firebrand for me. Um, one of our taglines is equity by design. And part of that is um, hoping to help folks who are working toward a more equitable world achieve that, um, specifically by helping them in the design department or in the design part of what they're doing. Uh, another way of interpreting that is that my hope is that my studio someday, when I have more employees, um, just is an equitable sort of place to exist and, and to practice design, um, meaning, you know, fair wages and a work-life balance that uh, works for each member of the studio um, and giving people time and space to develop their own sort of voice and style and, uh, and making it a place where other humans can thrive. Um, another idea that sort of orbits uh, that orbits around in my mind and, and for Firebrand is that design is listening. Design is not just um, sort of fonts and, and colors. I feel like those are artifacts and a really literal way of thinking about design. But for me, the design process is about being open to other voices and sources of inspiration um, and open to making connections that um, might not be sort of the first connection that we'd make in our own sort of subjective experience, but being willing to um, sort of sit in silence for a little bit and, and open ourselves up to what others have to say. Um, and then the other piece is, as Isaac said, centering those who are building a practice with those who are centering um, other people and um, our sort of shared humanity and then also the planet and trying to be more sustainable um, and uh, eco eco-friendly. Um, and the way that we sort of go about that is by following this fire code. Um, the fire code is how I sort of make business decisions, especially in this first year. It's been really important for me to um, define the parameters of how, how I want to work and not just what I want to work on. So these are some of those principles. Um, context is queen, taking into account the, um, the history and sort of the continuum of graphic design that I exist in and, and not pretending that anything was sort of like this lone wolf, lone genius idea. Um, we don't design trash. Uh, our, our studio, my studio isn't really interested in working on um, Ephemera, ephemera or, or single-use plastic packaging or things like that. Um, nothing is lost by sharing information, making sure that um, I'm constantly and continuously learning and sharing uh, my thoughts and learnings with other people, um, but also sharing it with my clients and helping them sort of uh, be the best that they can be in terms of being self-sufficient once I exit the, the process and exit working with their brand. Um, not being afraid to evolve. So constantly learning, as I said before, and I'll talk about some of the things that I've been learning this past year, and then honoring the humanity in everyone. So again, that's um, 
really valuing work-life balance and really remembering that um, people are humans and sometimes people just need to be checked in with as a human um, and not as a client or as an employee or collaborator. So that's the how of what we do at Firebrand, but the, the, the what of what we do or the literal of what we do is uh, brand design, UI UX and web design, and then print and packaging design. And you can see some examples here um, of past projects that I've worked on. And most of these are up on my website if you'd like to go and sort of look at them in more detail. But today I'm gonna show you some stuff that's not on my website, which is super fun and cool um, and in progress. Cool, so current projects. I'm gonna start off with one that um, you might've seen on my Instagram if you, if you pre-stocked me, which is totally fine. That's what social media is for. Um, <laughs> but I am currently working on a typeface um, called Octavia, named after Octavia Butler, who is a Southern California um, sci-fi writer. She is um, this incredible uh, prophetic uh, Black woman. She, right now I'm listening to her book, Parable of the Sower, um, that's sort of talking about the end times uh, and, <laughs> and how they affect Los Angeles and Southern California, and it's been a bit of a trip. So this typeface is partially inspired by her, partially inspired by um, a lot of other sort of references that I'll show you in a second. Um, I also want to shout out Graham Bradley. I made this typeface during the 10-week um, course that I took with the Letterform Archive and Type West. It was sort of an intro to type design. Um, and he took us through all of the basics of um, designing and sort of creating a concept around your font all the way up through how to use RoboFont and how to export something that you can actually type with, which is awesome. So here are a few of my references for the typeface. So on the left is a not yet finished um, drawing of a comic that doesn't exist, but exists in my mind called Galactic Girl. Uh, and it's about, um, a time slash dimension traveling woman with a nebula afro. Uh, so this typeface is very much made to be used on, on covers of, of that potential comic. Um, showing some other references in the middle, looking at sort of Afrofuturism, looking at um, sort of these expansive shapes uh, and new ways of thinking about the sci-fi genre that are a little bit more femme and more queer and more organic. Um, and then of course, looking at classic sci-fi references like 2001 and their use of Euro style and sort of the mid-century retro futurist vibes that they have going on. Um, but as a base shape, I'm using the super ellipse, which is sort of uh, the shape right between a square and a circle. And I love the way that that starts to reference um, orbits of planets and and sort of these large scale natural phenomena. So here are some of the base letters. Um, when you're designing a font, uh, some of the letters that you're asked to start with are the roundest letter and the straightest letter on round and straight being on, on sort of both sides. Um, so you can see here that the O very much is that super ellipse and then I'm starting to find ways to add interesting curves and details to even the straight letters. So the H has kind of got this, I like to think of it as like a, a branch or a stem sort of coming off of um, that first vertical to create the crossbar. And then the N is sort of mimicking that shape as well, but it has this cut in it, um, sort of a, a funky little ink trap at the, the top left. Um, Here's a little sentence that I wrote about the, the typeface. I think it captures um, sort of the lava lampy amorphous blend of references that I'm trying to, to make. So it says, her name will be Octavia. Octavia embodies the great both and. 
Her aesthetic core is the retro futurist, boxy thick, super ellipse. She is both organic and mechanic in her natural curves and no nonsense, low contrast body. She prophesizes femmes among the stars with her expansive counters and jet setting crossbars. She belongs to Catherine, May, Iris, and Gigi. And those names are references to um, some of the women that did the uh, calculations and who were mathematicians at NASA um, that you might have seen in um, Hidden Figures. And then um, May, who was one of the first Black women to go to space, and Iris Van Herpen, who is one of my favorite uh, fashion designers. And then Gigi is the short name for Galactic Girl. Um, so here is an example of the first drawing that I did of the typeface and it's next to sort of where I'm at now. I'm on, <laughs> on version Q uh, and there are some really subtle differences, I think, in the overall weight of the typeface, but also cleaning up some of the funkier letters like the A and the G. Uh, so you're starting to get a sense of kind of what the process looks like um, and how some shifts are really big and some shifts are, are super subtle, but I tried to keep sort of the original spirit of it. Here's what the uppercase set looks like. And here's the lowercase. Um, here are some vibey sort of statements that I think um, start to capture the voice that, that I would hope uh, would use this font. I don't know if anyone remembers Qui-Gon Jinn. He's one of my favorite Star Wars characters. <laughs> and then here were some um, specimens and examples that I made at the end of the class to show sort of how I would hope the typeface would be used. Um, the first two are fictional, a uh, fictional magazine cover and a comic book cover. And the last one is a um, redo of the typography on uh, a jazz track that I like a lot that I think also embodies kind of all the both ends that the typeface does. So yeah, this is something that I, put down for about a month and I'm going to, I'm hopefully picking back up again in November to uh, return to with fresh eyes and refine and um, hoping to be able to send it to other designers and folks who want to try it out um, to see what people make. Cool. So that was a sudden jump, but it's cool. Um, so the next thing I want to show very quickly is this identity design that I did earlier in the year for uh, Burnt Sienna Research Society. Shout out to Jason E.C. Wright, who I think, is, I think joined the call, which is awesome. Hi, Jason. Um, this is a little bit of the process that I go through with um, clients that come to me for brand design. So I will typically, and this is, this is pulled directly from the presentation. So Burnt Sienna Research Society is a research agency for design, craft, and urbanism. And they were looking for an identity that sort of captured their methodology, which is updating the past, rooting the present, preserving the future. And these um, images on the right side are some of the references that they sent. So um, references to sort of like craft and old packaging, like the paper and the wax seals. But then I was also seeing um, like the bronze piece, for example, which is like mid-century sort of modernism and clean lines uh, and seeing the ways that those things wove together and were sort of opposites, but also spoke could potentially speak to each other um, in one design system was an interesting challenge for me. So I'm going to show you the three initial uh, brand directions that I'd shown them. And um, I like to do storytelling when I think about brands. I generally will start with a mood board um, 
and some sort of write up. Sometimes it's a few sentences. In this case, it was a question. I asked, is Burnt Sienna a cabinet of curios? So in addition to being a research agency, Burnt Sienna puts on um, what they call sort of creating public space for introverts. Uh, so they, they put on reading rooms and um, they have a book club and a walking club. And I love the idea that you sort of enter um, the brand space, whether that's digital or physical, and you always find something new and interesting and kind of quirky. Um, so this was the logo type that I did for that. The top part that says Burnt Sienna is hand-drawn, sort of referencing um, Art Nouveau and bringing in these elements of, of craft and um, sort of classic forms. And the bottom part is, is just a typeface, but it was a lot of fun to draw this. And then showing some um, sort of supporting badges. We knew that we wanted to have a monogram as part of the uh, identity system. So these were a couple of things that I explored. And here were some mock-ups that I showed to sort of bring it to life. Um, for the second concept I asked, is Burnt Sienna a secret society? Um, the client described this uh, particular mood board is feeling very like dark academia, which I thought was an apt description. Um, lots of dark wood seals and um, sort of unexpected badges and, and symbology. This is another custom type that I did. I had a lot of fun with that, that ligature, um, the NN is probably my favorite two letters that I've, uh, that I've made together. Um, and for this direction, I suggested that the uh, main sort of mascot or, or motif be the octopus, which was the founder's favorite um, animal. And what he loves about it is that it fights, um, it fights off its enemies with ink and he is um, an avid writer. And then for the last direction, I, I usually like to show sort of a wild card. Um, so this one didn't um, as heavily reference sort of older forms and more classic and more of a classic aesthetic. Uh, it was more about looking forward and looking at some of the other references that he had shown, which were um, these super modern kind of minimalist uh, design studios and architecture firms. And I found this awesome letter from Isaac Asimov, who's a sci-fi writer, um, where he says that a library or um, a space full of books is, is actually a time machine and a spaceship uh, that can take you to the farthest reaches of the universe, which I think is such a beautiful metaphor. So I asked, is Burnt Sienna a spaceship? And um, I pulled on sort of cleaner lines, I think a more subtle color palette here um, and looked at, yeah, just different ways of, of thinking about the concept of books and research and um, bringing that together with something that felt like uh, a world-class uh, design research firm. So this was the third logo I presented and the reference here is sort of um, a stack of books that's a little bit off kilter. Um, sort of expanding on that visual metaphor, I took the stack of books and restacked it in a couple of different ways. Something nice that naturally happened with this direction was that Burnt Sienna contains the um, initials of the entire brand name. So I did sort of a um, redaction of all of the other letters and used that as the, the monogram. And then the shapes on the, uh, the shape on the left side is um, seven books that represent sort of the seven principles of, of the studio or of the design firm.
Um, ooh, I might skip over this one depending on, oh, it's actually only 12.30, cool. Um, so the last project I wanna show, it's not really a design project, it's more of an ongoing activity is something that I'm doing with the Facebook Analog Research Lab, which is sort of um, Facebook's art department. Uh, they put on art workshops and sort of um, creative bonding times for Facebook employees. And they also provide um, in non-COVID times a physical space, um, often with a Rizzo printer and other art supplies for people to come in and use um, sort of as they please. Uh, and I want to shout out Natalie Center, who is a friend of mine and an incredibly talented Rizzo artist and printer um, who helped me set up this workshop. Um, so the workshop was developed completely for um, for Zoom. It was it was developed to uh, start in July 2020. So we knew we wouldn't have sort of a shared space and shared art supplies or the intimacy of that. And we wanted to make something that um, I wanted to make something that was sort of used the isolatedness of Zoom to, to our advantage, but um, also helped people connect more deeply and maybe start conversations about how they're feeling um, with the support system that is, or should I think be your coworkers. So these were some of the materials that people were asked to bring. Um, we have at the beginning of each uh, workshop session, sort of a little discussion about privilege and reframing that, or at least framing it for the sake of the discussion. Um, the way I think about privilege is uh, as power, as social power and capital and um, the ways that that feeds uh, into resource access and, and monetary access. And I, and I always like to address sort of these two things that um, buttress privilege or support it in sort of a negative way. I think often people say, oh, you know, privilege isn't real. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Um, and that's this idea of toxic individualism, which doesn't take into account the, the context and the history that, that privilege carries. Um, and on the other side of that is just a lack of awareness of the expansiveness of privilege and of sort of the, our definitions of privilege. Um, I talk about how introspection is such an important part of the moment that we're in right now. Um, and I think that it's one of the first steps to opening us up to seeing that the way the world has been working is not the way that it should work um, or the way that we want it to work. Um, so before we get into privileged constellations, I will usually take participants through a warm-up exercise called the great both and. And the purpose of this exercise is to do a little bit of doodling, um, but also to open up our brains to the fact act that two things that are seemingly opposite can exist at the same time and can actually sort of hold each other um, in tension or hold each other in orbit. So one of the examples I give is um, right now there's a lot that we are learning, but also a lot that we have to unlearn at the same time. Um, we're learning so many new things about other people's experiences and how the world works, but we're also unlearning old beliefs um, and maybe old uh, things that we trusted in and old institutions that are no longer serving us. Uh, another both and is being isolated. A lot of people miss their friends, miss being in class, miss commuting to work, um, not the commute itself, but going to a different place. Um, and that feels really isolating and lonely but at the same time, it's this collective experience um, that's incredibly sort of unique to this time where everybody in our lives has been touched by um, the pandemic or by the uh, uprisings this past summer uh, that are ongoing in some way.
Um, and then we, oh yeah, okay. And then we get into areas of privilege. So this is um, sort of a non-exhaustive key of the different ways that we think about privilege. It's not just uh, white privilege or, or male privilege, but there are aspects of our upbringing and family that we talk about, aspects of wealth and access and inheritance, and then also privileges that we have professionally um, and in our sort of education that, that we talk about. And then we sort of grade those privileges um, with different colors. So here's an example of a question I might ask. Um, I would say draw a square, which relates to education and, and professional um, access, and then give sort of different um, levels. And, and this is just one of about a dozen questions that I ask, but it starts to help each individual paint a picture of um, what their life has looked like and how things are sort of interconnected. Um, and then here you can see a couple of folks um, showing their uh, different privilege constellations with all of the shapes and, and whatever uh, colors they, they chose for each of them. Um, and then also connecting a lot of the shapes to each other. So sometimes I'll say, um, uh, if people at your job look like you, um, <laughs> then connect all of your squares to your circles, for example. So now we're going to segue very quickly into sort of my last topic, which um, is about success and defining success for ourselves. Uh, this is something Isaac and I have been uh, talking about and, and wanted to, um, I don't know, cover, address, get some thought starters on. It's something that I've been thinking a lot about personally, um, sort of continuously. I don't think that I've arrived at any perfect answer. Um, so as somebody who was recently a student, this, this is a question that I'm often asking myself um, as somebody who's sort of just starting out in her career. And that, that is like, what is success? Um, and who is defining success for me? This is a question that I'm, that I'm always asking. Um, I think for some of us, it's our parents. Maybe it feels like it's our professor or our university. Um, maybe it feels like broader culture or society defines success to a certain degree. Um, or maybe it's our, ourselves, which is great. Um, I think it's, most important to define it for ourselves. And the reason for that is two things. The first one is that everyone else's definition of success for you is a moving target. Um, your parents and your professors and society all have different definitions and they're all sort of amorphous and changing all the time because those people haven't thought as much about your life as you have necessarily. Um, and then the other sort of God tier uh, therapist advice that I, that I heard earlier this year that helped me so much was what others think of you is none of your business. Um, so it's important for us to define success for ourselves because um, other people's definitions are, are irrelevant <laughs> and uh, un unobtainable. Um, and I think when we think about success, we're like, okay, what would other people think? What would other people have to see for me to be successful? But instead we should be asking ourselves, what do I value? What's important to me? Um, the word success, like, I don't know, can, can make people nervous. It makes me nervous um, because it feels like there's a value judgment. Um, but when I ask what's important to me and what do I individually value, then my answer becomes a lot more clear. Um, so here are some examples of things that you may value and they're all over the map in terms of bigness and smallness. Um, 
there are personal values and professional values, but the important thing is sort of um, making a list and writing them all down, no matter how big or small they are. Um, and they start to give you some guideposts for making decisions about your life. So maybe you value, hopefully you value uh, having a living wage, being able to pay your bills. Maybe it's important to you to be famous in your field. Um, maybe you want creative freedom. Maybe you want to be your own boss. Uh, maybe you want to have a dog. Maybe you want to raise a family and have kids. Uh, maybe you want to live near the mountains or um, near the beach because you really like to surf. Um, hopefully you value your mental health and, and peace of mind. Um, so asking yourself, what uh, those things are can help you to set parameters for what you want to do after school or what you want to do, you know, in 10 years or 20 years. So for example, if you say, um, I want to have kids or I want to have a dog, then maybe it's important to you to have a house with a yard and you sort of backtrack from there um, on how, how to meet that goal and, and find your own success. So these are some, uh, this is a very quick list of things that I value. It's not the full list, um, but I, I like getting enough sleep. I don't like pulling all-nighters. So that sets some parameters for me of um, my working hours. Um, I value meaningful work and I put a big asterisk here because meaningful is incredibly subjective and I have my own definition of it um, and you should too. And I value having time for side projects. Um, I find that my side projects fuel my own sort of personal growth journey, but also fuel um, the work that I do for others. Often people will say, hey, I like this uh, project that you did. And I'll say, oh, cool. Yeah, that was a personal project. Um, <laughs> people really respond to that. So that's something that I, I like to make time for. Um, and I think it's also important to define what's less important to you or what's like a nice to have or what's a second or third tier thing um writing down that it's not as important to you is as impactful as writing down the things that are super important so for me uh working at like a super well-known studio or working with super fancy well-known clients isn't as important to me um Living in a cool apartment in a cool neighborhood, not as important to me. Um, design minimalism, <laughs> like aesthetic minimalism uh, in my home and in my work is, is not as important to me. Um, so knowing those things sort of can free us up from some of the expectations I think that we might assume other people have of us. Um, so yeah, I think take some time today or this weekend and ask yourself, what, what do you value? Um, and how does that affect how you think about um, life during school and what school success looks like, and then life post-graduation? And remember that it's okay to revisit your list very often. I would even say revisit it um, every quarter or every six months and know that your priorities and your mindset will change and that's totally okay you're not like a hypocrite for saying hey it's no longer important to me to do this thing now this thing is important um because as we have all seen life circumstances change <laughs> very quickly sometimes um yeah so that is my talk and I would love to hear any questions from you guys and just kind of have an open discussion. You can ask me about the work that I showed or about, um, yeah, anything you like. And you can screenshot this, this page if you wanna um, further stalk me on, on the web. All right, cool. Um, if you're feeling brave, just go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Yeah, you can unmute. It doesn't have to be in the chat. Um, oops. <laughs> oh. 
Thanks, guys. Uh, since learning the process of type design, how has that informed or changed your design practice and design process? Um, that's a great question, Christian. So uh, I was doing, I was sort of outlining, like expand, you know, the expand tool on um, Illustrator. I was sort of outlining fonts and um, editing them to some degree for logo types before I took this class um, and doing lettering and personal projects around type design and type creation before this class. But what this uh, new, new information that I have is, has sort of given me is um, a greater ability to critique type um, and to see what's funky about it. And it's also taught me how to draw, uh, at least in a vector-based format, how to draw type um, in a way that's easier to edit and sort of uh, has cleaner curves and, and less points on it. Um, so that's like a very literal sort of hands-on uh, answer to your question. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, people are liking the queue. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, how do you approach pitching for large slash ambitious projects? Um, that's a great question. I think it is, and this is something I'm still exploring for myself, but um, as a new studio and a younger designer, I think it's easy to be nervous about pitching and putting ourselves out there. Um, I try to remind myself that the work that maybe a larger project is asking for um, is often just a larger timeline or a larger scale than something small that I've already done. Um, so mentally or sort of emotionally, the way I prepare is I say, hey, I've actually already done this, or I've done things similar to this, maybe in a lot of little projects. Um, and that's how I um, align my, my pitch presentations as well, is if somebody's like, oh, I want a website that does this, this, and this, I'll say, okay, well, I've done two websites that do two of those things, and this other website that does something that's kind of similar. Could you talk about near futures and then how you got there? Um, yeah, so <laughs> when I think of futurism, I think of um, sort of like high tech, hyper ambitious, sort of sci fi esque problem solving. Like people are like, how do we live forever? Um, and for me, near futurism is about using existing uh, technologies and sort of like existing uh, and looking at problems that, that are more, uh, more present. Like instead of saying, how can we um, get a few rich people to live forever? I'm asking myself, how can we make it so that everybody has access to healthcare? Uh, how can we make it so that more people have access to fresh vegetables? And those, the answers to those questions aren't really as like cool or, or cool quote unquote to think about, but like having a community, community garden and a farmer's market in a neighborhood is something that's been done for um, ever since humans were, you know, growing their own food. Uh, and so sort of taking into account these things that we could do uh, in the next five or 10 years versus saying in 50 years, maybe a few people can go to Mars. <laughs> no, you're all good, Christian. Uh, how do you get clients to see the value of custom type slash lettering over a font, especially since hand-drawn type is more con uh, time consuming and can be more expensive? So I haven't done um, 
custom type for, I haven't done a custom typeface for a client ever. I think it could be interesting. I've mostly done custom logo types, which is, you know, a, one set of characters, usually one or two words. Um, I actually, I will tell clients when something is a typeface versus custom lettering, but I, if I'm presenting multiple options, I won't sort of push them toward the custom lettering just because I spent more time on it. Um, I will say I spent time on this because I felt like uh, the idea in my head was um, something that I wanted to make custom versus spending time finding a typeface someone else had done, knowing that I was going to modify it anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm, I think part of being a type designer for me is um, knowing how to find a font that already exists that is speaking sort of in the voice that I want to use and then knowing when I can't necessarily find that voice and I have to make it myself. Um, so in the case of Octavia, uh, some folks who critiqued the typeface were like, oh, there's like too many different ideas in the typeface. Um, and maybe there are, but I didn't want it to just look like Euro style or, or some other sort of uh, extended sans serif. And so I had these funkier elements and I kind of knew that I, I wanted it to have a, a funkiness to it. Yeah. Anyone else? I think we have time for maybe two more questions, maybe three. Do you start creating the logo type first and then you do the typeface? Um, great question though. So most of my logo types I, I have never done a custom logo type that's become a typeface. Um, I've actually only ever designed one typeface, which is Octavia. If a client asked me to take uh, a logo type and sort of build that into a type system, I could do it. It's not something that, that I have done yet though. Claire asks, was there a specific point or moment in your life where you started feeling successful and how has that impacted your work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would not say that it's linear. Uh, I think that, yeah, it's uh, your question is kind of like, when, when do you arrive at success or when did you arrive at success? I would say that there, there are moments where I'm like, oh, this project was a success, or I feel affirmed in the work that I'm doing. Um, right now, I feel, I feel successful in that I feel like I'm doing what I wanted to do with Firebrand. And on the flip side, I feel unsuccessful in that I think my work-life balance isn't exactly where I want it to be. And that's something that that I'm still working on. Um, but I'm not, I'm trying not to put too much pressure on myself to like get it all right, um, like as soon as possible. I, th I think it's always a process and a lot of like trial and error. So I'm giving myself a little bit of grace in that way. Um, at what point do you know that a project is complete? How involved are the clients in the process? So um, most, yeah, every project that I work on has, yeah, of course, Claire, has a uh, project timeline or a scope of work. So the scope of work is um, literally an agreement of how we're going to work together. And I'll say, okay, I'm going to show you this presentation with three different logo concepts. 
then you pick a logo concept and we refine it for two rounds and then we go into sort of the rest of the brand identity process so that's like a very small example um and either the project will end when we have finished the scope of work and have delivered the final files uh or it ends and or it ends because they're like okay we have a hard stop in um, July so that's the end of the project for so it's it's pretty literal um, I'm constantly checking in with my clients at every step of the process and saying hey uh, how's this feeling do you like this are we still aligned um, for personal projects I currently I think of a lot of them as ongoing and I try not to put too much pressure on myself about like this has to be done by this date um, because I found that like having guilt around unfinished projects just makes me not finish them more um, versus saying like, hey, it's okay. It's like an ongoing process and uh, it's okay if I like put this down for a few months or put it on the back burner and then pick it back up. Yeah, I'll put a, a link to my Instagram and website in the chat. Um, cool. Any last questions? These were all really good. Oh, let's see. Um, has anything surprised you in the responses to your writing from this summer? Do you see a willingness for change in the industry? Um, I was surprised by, yeah, I was surprised by the positive response. And I think, um, that so many people were like, hey, I showed this to my boss or I showed this to my coworkers and it really resonated with me and it's resonating with them. Um, or they'll say, hey, your writing inspired, yeah, inspired me to like call somebody out at work or inspired me to rethink um, the kind of people I wanna be working with or the kind of work I wanna be doing. And uh, what I expected was a lot of negative responses because the internet can just be a cruel place for no reason. Um, but I got a lot of um, positivity instead, which is really encouraging. All right. Okay, so um, I guess we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you so much. That was such an amazing talk. Um, uh, and I really appreciate the beautiful way that you articulated um, both kind of like the place where you're designing from uh, your fire code, um, and, and then like, uh, the vastly different kinds of projects that you work on, um, and sort of the thinking throughout that. Uh, I, that was amazing. Um, thank, you thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And um, to everybody who came, thank you for your great questions. Uh, you are so welcome to reach out on Instagram or through my contact page and ask follow up questions if you were shy here. Uh, that is that is totally fine. I love talking to students. <laughs>